There are four things that affect how long anesthesia takes to leave your system. One of them is your mental health state, anxiety and history of past traumas. Another one is the type of surgery. Another one is your medical history. And the last one is what type of anesthesia is being used. Anything from gases, like the ones that come out of the ventilator behind me, to IV agents like propofol or midazolam or fentanyl. So good to see everyone coming on here and I appreciate everyone's warm comments, especially with everything that we've been going through. I really appreciate it, thank you. So number one is the type of surgery you're having because certain surgeries require more anesthesia and the more anesthesia you get, typically the longer it takes to wake up. Hello Heidi, good to see you as well. So the biggest one is neurosurgery. When people are having surgery in their brain, you're inherently uh, interrupting brain tissue. Interrupted brain tissue takes longer to wake up from anesthesia. It might take hours or sometimes even days after major brain surgery to wake up from anesthesia for its effects to wear off of your brain. Another intensive surgery is cardiac surgery. So things like cardio uh, coronary artery bypass, like when people say they've had a triple bypass or a cabbage. Those surgeries also typically take longer because the healing process and the anesthesia wearing off kind of melt together and it can take a long time. Kathy, thank you for that super thanks. Some hospitals will have patients actually stay intubated overnight and then they begin to remove the breathing tube the following day after major cardiac surgery. In other institutions, they'll actually wake patients up in the operating room. There is some variability because it is a major surgery and the body takes longer to wake up. The effects of the anesthesia may last longer as well. Very good questions uh, for everyone who's asked. And the other big point for the surgery is the duration because the longer the surgery, the more anesthesia is hitting your brain and the next part is going to be the specific anesthesia type. Sorry, <coughs> when you're going live, sometimes you have to clear your throat. <laughs> so number two is anesthesia. And the longer your surgery is, the longer the context-sensitive half-life of anesthetics kicks in. The context-sensitive half-life is a really special concept because it doesn't come up for most medications. Vanix, thank you for that super thanks as well. It's very kind. The longer a medication is hitting your brain, it is not linearly correlated to the amount of time it takes to wear off. So for example, if you got a propofol infusion, remember propofol is the white one here. If you received propofol for 60 minutes, it would take about 10 minutes for the propofol to wear off. But if you had propofol for two hours, it might take 30 minutes for the propofol to wear off fully. These numbers aren't exact, it's an order of magnitude. Every additional hour of that white medication takes another 10 minutes to what would be a standard time that you'd expect it to wear off. Once again, these are all very rough numbers that we use when we try to time patients waking up because the anesthesia has to come out of your brain so that your brain can function again. Gases are kind of similar. The most commonly used gas in the United States is going to be sevoflurane here. It's always marked with a yellow label. Sevoflurane comes off relatively quickly. Similar to propofol, about 10 minutes or so, if timed correctly, you can actually begin to wake up. It might take 20 minutes. Typically, the longer the surgery, the more it has gone into your lean body mass. So the sevoflurane molecules go into fatty tissue into lean body mass, like your muscle. And the more anesthesia gas or liquid like propofol is in your body, it takes longer for it to all come out of your body and to ultimately leave your brain. So for average day surgeries, we're talking about patients usually coming to within 60 minutes. Most patients leave an ambulatory surgery center, like a day surgery center, within an hour after general anesthesia, or they're ready to go at least. If you have major surgery in a hospital, you might be there overnight, but the anesthesia will certainly wear off in most cases before you're actually ready to leave the hospital. It might take a couple of hours as long as it's not major cardiac surgery or major brain surgery. There are, of course, other exceptions, but that's the general rule of thumb. Now, there's also a dependence on the type of medication used. If it is isoflurane, I don't even have it here because it's kind of old, it's usually a purple gas. Hey, Heidi, thank you for that super thanks as well. The purple label, isoflurane, that one actually sticks in the body longer. It might take more than just 10 or 20 minutes after the average length of surgery. 
There's another one called desflurane that comes off very fast. It's also very expensive and is a very potent greenhouse gas. So it's actually not used for those reasons and others in the operating room. It can also be irritating to the lungs and might trigger asthma. There's a medication called nitrous oxide laughing gas. You see this blue one here? Laughing gas is special because it comes on very quickly and it comes off very quickly. And you could theoretically wake up within minutes, even if you've been on laughing gas for a very long time. But laughing gas is also a, a tremendous environmental pollutant, and it's not used for that and several other reasons. There's a very good question by Ma Mama Bear 76 hair loss after anesthesia. That's a really good question. It's called telogen effluvium. We believe it's the same reason that any hair loss can happen after a prolonged stressor or a significant stressor, whether it's surgery or anesthesia, car accident, loss of a loved one. Uh, when I started college many years ago at Berkeley, I actually lost part of one of my eyebrows. It was very, I was like, what is going on? But anyways, you can imagine a giant life stressor <laughs> and um, telogen effluvium, you can look it up. Fortunately, it is reversible once the body renormalizes. Speaking of stressors and traumas, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, actually, if you guys appreciate me coming on here, even with all the challenges that we've been going through, like I mentioned, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Lisa, we'll talk about redheads as well. That's actually coming up as well, but um, your support helps me do this more often. And I don't like to do ads or product placement. I want you to learn more so you can be more confident about your body and how it works, whether you're having surgery or not, or share with people who you love <laughs> who are having surgery to help empower them because you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And with this knowledge, you can certainly take advantage of that power. So um, before we talk about redheads and the mental health and trauma components that can influence how long it takes anesthesia to wear off, we need to talk about the other types of medications, specifically midazolam, Versed, can stick around the body for a long time if it's given as an infusion. It's half-life, or the time it takes for the blood concentration to half, is not as short as most medical students and doctors think, especially if they've been receiving it for a long time, if the patient has been receiving it for a long time, because it also builds up in fatty tissues. Another commonly used medication is fentanyl, the one seen here. Fentanyl, if given as an infusion during a surgery, can stick around the body for a long time compared to shorter acting opioids like sufentanil or remifentanil. However, it is much shorter acting than longer acting opioids like hydromorphone or Dilaudid. Donna, thank you for that super thanks. So the type of medication also has a different half-life, meaning how long it, lit, it hangs around your bloodstream, the residue that someone had mentioned earlier. And like Skater Surfer says, fentanyl is a pain med and we use it during surgery either as infusions or as bolus pushes to help minimize the need for other anesthetics. That's called a balanced anesthetic by using multiple agents so that we minimize the toxicities and side effects of any individual agent. So next, the question is about redheads. Redheads might be more tolerant to the yellow gas. I pause a little bit because it's still a controversial issue. And the biggest issue that I think patients should know about if they have redhead is that the anxiety and the buildup to needing more anesthesia can increase anxiety that can increase anesthesia requirements. Levi is asking about red beards. Red beards do not appear to have the same basis genetically as the, of the melanocortin-1 gene mutation that redheads have. So it looks like it's different, but it's still overall a very, uh, a lot of research to be done because the anxiety component from fearing that you need more anesthesia and that you will be underdosed or wake up can actually cause you to need more anesthesia because the more you wind up the brain, whether from current anxiety, past anxieties, panic attacks, medical trauma, these might increase and certainly in children, it appears more so because they've been studied more to increase anesthesia requirements. So the more anesthesia you get, the typically longer it takes or typically the longer it takes to wake up. So patients that are anxious, alone, they might take longer to wake up because they have needed more anesthesia, but I'll tell you the far more important 
component is when patients have mental health conditions that they're trying to self-medicate, especially with marijuana or cannabis. I'm not implying anything bad about it per se, except that it is often used in a non-healing way. The cannabis plant can be very powerful when used appropriately, but in my experience, the risks of how it's used recreationally, especially when it's advertised the way it is here in the Bay Area in San Francisco where I work, um, the effects can be the opposite because they might dramatically increase how much anesthesia a patient needs and it might take them so much longer to wake up in addition to increasing other side effects. Once again, I'm not anti-cannabis, but I'm anti-using it in a way that's not responsible. Different discussion for a different time, but when I have redheads or anxious individuals or individuals with traumas or chronic pain, insomnia, etc., who are using cannabis to help with those conditions, once again, it's not about judging, it's about recognizing that the more THC, possibly CBD, but we don't know yet, the more THC the brain sees, the longer the wake up might be because they need so much more anesthesia. So that propofol, doses that you're giving, will hang around the body longer, the contact sensitive half-life kicks in because the longer they've gotten the infusion and the higher the dose of propofol, the longer it's gonna take to wake up. Now, if somebody wakes up delirious or combative, like someone just asked, that's also a very uh, important point. One, patients can harm themselves. Two, they might have a traumatizing experience. Unlikely, but it's possible. But number three is that the longer it might take. Because if a patient, especially a child, wakes up combative in emergence delirium, sometimes we need to put them back to sleep. One of my favorite medications for that is dexmedetomidine, brand name Presidex. Sometimes you can give a very low dose to calm the emergence delirium, but not put them back to sleep. Sometimes, however, they need, an, they need so much anesthesia to come out of their emergence delirium that they will actually sleep longer. So instead of a 10 or 20 minute kind of reorienting, it might take 45, 60, 75 minutes. These aren't make it or break it differences, but they do make a difference. Now, Southern Bell multiple times has said pseudocolonesterase enzyme deficiency. This is a very important condition. It's very rare, but it is very important. So thank you for bringing it up. This can prolong the amount of time it takes to wake up, but not for any of the standard reasons we talked about. This is a really kind of a scary disease because if you don't have the gene that it takes to metabolize this medication here called succinylcholine, it even says warning paralyzing agent. If you don't have the enzyme that it takes to metabolize or break down this medication, you will be asleep longer. Maybe not consciously asleep, but your body will be paralyzed longer. I've seen this once in the last 10 years. And it was weird because the patient was like trying to say something, but it looked like they were sleepy. They weren't asleep though. They were trying to speak, but they were still very weak because they didn't have the enzyme. You and me, if we have normal metabolism enzymes, we will metabolize succinylcholine in a matter of minutes. If you are heterozygous for that, it might take maybe 30, 45 minutes. If you're homozygous and you don't have it, I don't know if Southern Bell is heterozygous or homozygous, it might take over an hour, it might take plural hours. And we need to know, so some patients get it tattooed or, they wear, or they'll wear a medical bracelet. So in an emergency setting, they don't receive succinylcholine either if they have pseudocholinesterase deficiency, because then you might be awake but paralyzed, or they may have a bracelet for malignant hyperthermia, in which case they can't receive succinylcholine either. Now, Linda Brawley, I really appreciate your super thanks there. It means a lot. Um, I hope that you're learning some good stuff here. Now, I wanted to end by just saying that the medical trauma that can happen in the operating room or that patients bring into the operating room really needs to be acknowledged. I've had so many patients over the years that come in with an anxiety that they're unwilling to share with anyone else until you close the curtain and sit down. You may need to hold their hands. As you know, it's usually most contextually appropriate to touch a joint like a knee, an elbow, a shoulder, and look them in the eye and ask them to please be honest, be authentic. You know, the problem with PTSD, and I really credit Gabor Mate to making this uh, more publicly known, 
When we have PTSD, we're often inauthentic with ourselves or not honest enough with ourselves because we spend so much time in flight mode. Out of the fight, flight, and freeze responses, we're stuck in flight mode. So when we are not honest with ourselves because we're so disassociated from ourselves, we might not really even appreciate that we're anxious. And when we're not appreciating our anxiety, we can't accept help from others that are trying to help us reduce our anxiety. The more anxiety we bring into this operating room, like we said, it shows. It might show in that emergence delirium, which will take you longer to wake up because you need more anesthesia, more anesthesia, and longer wake up. It might increase your risk of just needing more anesthesia to stay asleep. It might increase your risk of any anesthesia awareness translating eventually to a potentially PTSD experience. I'm not saying every anxious patient will develop PTSD, but if heaven forbid something unfortunate happens, if your anxiety is too far off the chart, it is priming your central nervous system to register that experience as a traumatic one and without the right support can turn into acute stress disorder or PTSD. I've had patients that have taken a long time to wake up, maybe from pseudocolonesterase deficiency, like we said, or any other number of reasons, and they have this fear of, am I ever going to be back in my body? Why can't I move? I keep forgetting to breathe. These experiences can happen in prolonged wake-ups for any number of reasons. And we need to recognize it's not just a matter of slapping the patient in the face to say, hey, wake up, keep breathing, but to be present. Not shocking and jarring, because that does register in the body. You can look at the heart rate monitors. When you slap a patient awake, because they're taking a long time to wake up, you will see their sympathetic nervous system respond. How can we treat those patients that are taking longer to wake up for any number of those reasons that I mentioned? I'm not saying it's their fault, but it's something that their body is going through, and we need to respect that there is a natural waking up process influenced by those factors, and we can't simply force them out of it. Any more than you can force yourself to fall asleep at night. Sure, I guess you could take you know, Xanax or something, but we're talking about natural waking up, natural falling asleep. So that's why the trauma that we're bringing in, if we're not authentic with ourselves or our anesthesiologist or doctors, we close that door to them being able to help us have a safer and more healing experience, whether it's anesthesia and surgery, whether it's a psychedelic experience, like with my patients who are receiving ketamine in my ketamine infusion clinic, or if it's with your loved ones or your friends who are trying to help you heal from any number of struggles that you're trying to heal from. I hope that you do feel supported by your support group, and I hope that you also appreciate just how much power you have. You can't influence all of those factors I mentioned, but you can influence a lot of them. And I hope that you've taken away something that you can empower yourself with or those who you love, if they need surgery or in any other life stressors. Until next time, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told.